if we're all sitting comfortably, we'll uh, we'll give it. Oh, what have you got there? Oh, I, yeah, it's there. Uh, it's that healthy drink. You the know? can of Coke, Coca Cola. Other brands are available. Yes. Um, no, I've just been on the bike, so um, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of yeah. It's been in the fridge. I've been thinking about it for uh, like ninety minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to top trouble here. I have got Tiny Rebel. I don't know if you know them. They send me beers for every episode. So normally, yeah. So normally, I'd meet you in person. We'd have a couple of beers over over a chat. So um, I've got a jam donut pale ale. Pump up the jam. So thanks to Tiny Rebel. Tiny Rebel. Sorry, it's cat flap chats. <laughs> We are back again. I'm delighted to have Laurie Morgan with us today. Now, we're just saying off, uh, off pod, I have to do a bit of research on everything you've done, but I'm going to try and list off as much as I can. Endurance, uh, endurance athlete, adventurer, BAFTA winning TV presenter, author, represented Wales in rugby, athletics, cross country. You've done 150 mile Amazon jungle marathon. I'm one of only a few people to complete that. 350 mile ultra Arctic Circle Marathon and Journey. TV for S4C, ITV, BBC, Channel 4, Radio. You've been to the Titanic wreck, HMS Oxford wreck. Um, you can sing. I'm sure you can dance. You got a book out. You got a book out called Beyond Limits. Is there anything you can't do? I can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there actually there is an. Oh, that's um, that's a definite. Ask my husband, and he'd agree with me. Uh, I think I've got so many things going on in my mind. I just kind of put something in the oven, and I forget about it, and then yeah. I it, it's it's completely demolished. But, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's quite quite a lot of things I can't do. Um, but I'm not going to list them here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's all right. Hey, thank you so much for coming on. I suppose for, for me, because I I'd, I'd want to start back at the beginning. But first off, how's the last sort of I don't know six twelve months been for you, where you are such an outdoors person with your job and obviously with your lifestyle and life? How is that being kind of being restricted and, and stuck indoors a lot of the last 12 months? Um, I've found myself, um, and I've found it tough like all of us have, um, but I have found myself reverting back a lot to the lessons that I've learned on the trails. Yeah. Um, for example, um, the first marathon I ever ran, I thought it was 26 miles and it was in New York. And I was running and I was up to 25 miles. And I thought, oh, I've got one mile left. And I got to mile 26 and it was like, only 0.2 miles left. And I was like, oh. and that 0.2 of a mile was the worst thing ever because I didn't foresee that 0.2 of a mile. Yeah. And at the start of lockdown, I had that mentality. I never thought it's going to be a short lockdown. I always thought, you know, this is going to go on and on. I always expect the worst. Um, yeah. And uh, so that didn't come um, that, that much of a shock to me. Um, and I've also kind of given myself, uh, and these are lessons that I've learned on the trails as well, just, and I know it's such a cliche, but um, just put one foot after another. And yeah, I think yeah. um, with ultra running, when you're running a 350 mile race, you cut it into shorter parts. You never think of it as a 350 mile race. You think of it as, uh, two, two, maybe a hundred milers, uh, another hundred miler, and then a sprint finish at the end. Of 50 <laughs> miles, you know, it's just like thinking. Uh, let's talk about something that m many people might be able to relate to, because at the end of the day, not many people have run three hundred fifty miles. But let, let's think um, about a marathon. You never think of running it as twenty. Well, some people do, but I never think of running it as twenty six point two miles. I think of it as running. Um, uh, two 10 milers and then a 10k to finish okay I just, I just break it into tiny chunks and that's yeah. how I kind of got on with, with lockdown uh, you know we've had parents who have ended up in hospital and um, throughout the lockdown which hasn't been easy but still I think of myself as being one of the lucky ones yeah um, and and I have just had to see life like that throughout it all I've had to uh you know, homeschooling with my my son. I, I, we're still friends at the moment. <laughs> you know? 
Um, but um, you were asking what things that I'm not very good at. Maybe that's one thing that he would say. But no, we <laughs> pretend. But you know, it's all that kind of little tiny steps. You know, sometimes yeah. you take two steps backwards, but it's always that form, forward motion, forward momentum. You know, not giving up. And and what I gave myself when you asked me about how do I cope with being indoors, um, I made myself tiny goals every day. So every day. Uh, when we could do the one hour we we kind of um worked mm. it out together as a family i'm yeah. also not a great cyclist but i set up a turbo trainer in yeah. the house started to do that i was also training for a race at the time so i was panicking a bit because obviously i wasn't get getting in the mileage that i needed especially yeah. when I to so so it's always been about diversifying uh, working around the situation you're in um, and and just getting on with it, really. Every day is a new day. I like that. There's a load of things in there I could take from that. I think the one that resonates with me the most is that just one step forward. You know, it doesn't matter how big the mountain is, just take that next step and then the next step. And like, I'm someone, I've run, uh, well, I've, run I've run a 10K, I've run kind of half marathon. That's the upper limits of my endurance athlete career i couldn't i can't see myself ever doing a marathon but i don't particularly like running i find it really hard my knees find it really hard i'm a big guy how do you get from west wales to running 350 miles in one ultra race well i was told i was never able to do it basically uh i yeah. was able to run again um um, but you, you were talking about the mountain. That that's another cliche that I, I and mantra I tend to use. I always kind of always say that the best views come after the toughest climbs. Yeah, and yeah. Be true on on mountain um, running and ultra running, and I think it's true in life. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that I ever faced was when about eighteen years old. I I was playing rugby. Um, somebody uh, I went to university. Uh, Keris Matthews, the singer, had yeah. dropped out because she'd gone on to pursue a career in music, um, as we all know, with Catatonia. And they were like, oh, Lowry, please, we're desperate for somebody to to fill in on, on the wing. Um, and I was like, I was a big Swansea fan coming from that area, um, showing my age. That was pre- <laughs> <laughs> Pre-regions. <laughs> yeah. And um, I was like, yeah, I love rugby. Uh, my brother played to a good standard. And I was like, but I'm no way am I playing it. I'm an ath- you know, I'm a, I'm a running athlete. Um, you know, I was cross country track um, athlete um, and no way. And then they were like, we know you can run. We just want somebody to stand on the wing, just take the ball. And when you get to the white line at that corner, just, yeah. just dive over. And I said, like, yeah, are you okay, okay. So I played my first game of rugby for the university and I absolutely loved it. And yeah. then they said, you're not a winger because I was all over the shop, basically. Yeah. And soon I was in uh, in the forwards playing open side flanker. Yeah. And I just, I just loved the camaraderie. I loved the game. I loved everything about it, and but then I had a really serious accident uh, where I kind of shattered my knee and my ligaments and my uh, fibula and tibia, whatever. And um, I had this operation, and they said, you know, you've got to realise that you're not going to be able to run properly since then. Mm-hmm. And yeah. after that, and then I um, slowly left the hospital in a wheelchair. I, I you know, months in in um, uh, in a cast, um, and then. <laughs> They, uh, when, I, when I got the cast out, I said to the nurse, I said, look, can I start back training tonight? And uh, just to imagine my leg, I couldn't move my leg. It was completely rigid, straight. Oh. And she, she laughed and she said to, to the surgeon, she said, and the consultant said, oh, this, this one thinks she's going to start training tonight. And he said, well, if, if she thinks that she is going to start, then she will be able to start. And that night, my father drove me to a swimming pool yeah. and I sort of jumped into the the pool thinking you know because i was a strong swimmer as well yeah. I was a swimmer i thought ah no problem i literally you know my leg just couldn't pick me anywhere so it was yeah. a and everything but you know i just didn't give up i just kept going and there were tough days more tough days than easy days if i'm honest but i think the tough days make you stronger uh they make you more determined uh, and I think when you're in that position, when you are injured, as I'm sure you've interviewed so many, it, it, you know, it's part of a life of a... Yeah, of course it is. It, it, it is about telling yourself, I will be back stronger. Um, yeah. After, 
and not just physically but mentally as well um and i think that's made me um the athlete i am today i think if i hadn't had that injury i don't think i'd be here today talking to you i think it's made me first of all listen to my body so i'm very aware of niggles now yeah. uh, and also when i um I, I think i would have just taken things for granted and um I would sorry, my five year old. I said he, he would come in to have a have a look. <laughs> That's all right. That's fine. <laughs> right. Uh so uh, yeah, I lost my trail of thought there and sorry, but um taking it for granted. Yeah, I think so. So I've I've never taken anything for granted with, with my career as an athlete. Um and I just and also it's about pushing your limits. I think um as you were saying, oh I'll never be able to do that. Well you never know because I think once you get to that ultimate limit of your endurance and your body is telling you, this is ridiculous, Larry, what are you doing? You know, climbing yeah. this mountain uh, for, for example, like Squilliam has just come into shop now and, you know, when he is put in bed, I then go up to the Brecon Beacons and then I run overnight back to Cardiff, 60 miles over the mountains, uh, in time to take him to school in the morning. Um, Jesus. You know, I have to do those things to fit the training session in. So, you know, people say, you know, gosh, why, why on earth are you doing it? And, and you have to kind of question your why. Um, yeah. And why I do it, like I was saying, you, you get to that ultimate limit of endurance. Your body's saying, don't do that. You see you are rubbish, you know, or, you know, you know you're, you're crazy and just give up, you know, don't put yourself through this. You, you know, your mind's telling you all these, like, crazy stuff. And then... You, you hit this level, you hit your ultimate level, and then you realize that your limits don't break. They just bend. Yeah. They might break a little bit, but then you'll just find another level that, that brings you back up. And you start to revel in it. You start to really enjoy it. So it's just this question of just peaks and troughs, basically. And you're constantly going up and down, but you, you, you're still rising throughout it all. And when you finish that race, be it in life or, you know, on the trails you look back and you think god i climbed that mountain on my own i didn't think i could do that but i carried myself mentally and physically up that up that uh, mountain so i and i'm no superwoman i just think that we're all far stronger than what we really are yeah it's um there is tons there that i want to pick up on where did that mindset and mantra come from an 18 year old because most 18 when I was I'm 35 now right so when I was 18 I was okay at rugby actually growing up as a kid and it fell off the wayside because I found the usual vices of girls start drinking you know too cool to like be good at sport now and all that stuff in school and how I, I was definitely immature I hadn't really been through many like what we i suppose tough times to build resilience or um that mental toughness i suppose if that's the right term where did that come from from you then as a kid because you obviously ran and competed as a kid but where did that come from because that's not something lots of people have in them yeah that's a good question and when i was writing um the book beyond limits um i did a lot of thinking uh because that was a question that people kept asking me yeah. I still don't really know the answer. I think, you know, I asked my parents and they said, you know, I was adventurous even as, as a child. And I saw it with my son, you know, he, I was always saying, he's, he's not walking, he's not walking. He's just crawling everywhere. And my mother said, you were exactly the same. You just went from crawling to running. That, that was it. And that's <laughs> what he did. And, yeah. um, I, think, I think that determination and stubbornness really was, was there from the start. Um, I was always um, being brought up in Gower. We were brought up on the beaches. I was always looking for the biggest dune to kind of run up. Um, I remember being in France. Um, I've got so many scars um, from doing things like uh, when I was in France, my parents looked around. I, I must have been about six or seven. And they, they couldn't find me. I was always kind of going on little adventures. I don't know what I put them through. Um, <laughs> poor tabs. 
but you know they said that they looked round. there i was on top of this olympic diving board going i am mom i am dad and they were like don't jump don't jump and then i jumped you know yeah. and i and i split the inside of my mouth wide open i was swimming back and, and i was thinking what's all this pool of blood you know coming out <laughs> split all inside but you know so i was always pushing boundaries then um but i think um the fact that i i was a television presenter is also helped my running career yeah. progress because um i left i i was also quite immature as well um in school um, very uh, even though i talk for wales as you know um i um i was always quite i i suppose i came across as being quite confident because i could talk yeah. a lot and i could hold myself you know in 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 big in, in, well when I was when I had to basically yeah um, but I think I I also I was also quite insecure as well uh you know I never thought I was fast enough never thought I was pretty enough never thought I was you know had the, the idea of body shape um I always you know qu queried um myself basically against I was always comparing myself with other people and that's yeah. what I wrote about in the book saying you know how I used to look at others and 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 I'm still doing it, you know. When I went to do the Jungle Marathon, when, when I was like 36 years old, my first ever ultra marathon, I was on the start line. I remember when I did my first Ironman, I was doing the same, looking around all these different body shapes, going, "Oh, you know, I haven't got the right body shape for this." Yeah. yeah. You know, I did really well in it, so that was a massive lesson. But going back to when I started presenting, I was doing like a Blue Peter style program for SRC, yeah. and I sort of. Um, the, the previous years when I was in university after leaving there and graduating and I wanted to become a classical singer. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to be just like you with your rugby. I was a good uh, classical singer. Looking back now, I was a good classical singer. I just didn't have that confidence. I didn't think I was good enough. And I suffered. And because of that, I suffered. And I still suffer with being nervous, you know, getting yeah. a state right. Um, and I still get it before races and things like that um and i was used to go up on stage sing and i'd forget my words in front of like hundreds of people and it was terrifying sometimes i could sing and i loved it and i'd get lost in the music and then sometimes i would completely stand there and freeze and it's the same sometimes with my with my running you know at the, at the start line and i'm like you know so so nervous yeah. and what i taught myself now is to accept that nervousness um it's okay to be nervous you know if i do a live television program you know i'll get a bit nervous um but instead of trying to fight it i embrace it and yeah. i see it as adrenaline and it if i'm not nervous for something that's when the alarm bells go because it means that i'm not um what i'm going for is not worth it in my mind yeah yeah um, Sorry, I'm going <laughs> diverting the conversation. No, no, no. It's it's good. It's good to understand the mindset and that yeah. journey you've taken yourself on, no matter what you've achieved. Because I think I think part of what you said is real prevalent in today's society. You know, you look at you know, I'm, I'm probably just a bit too far on the other side of you know that Instagram and now TikTok and all that other stuff. But everything's a comparison. You know, real life versus instagram and you know everyone's perfect pictures yet you know that the boyfriend and girlfriend argued last night about fucking something or whatever it is you know they're not living perfect lives but it all it's all smiles on instagram or it's holiday snaps blah 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 and you know that they're in a load of debt i don't know right but we're always comparing ourselves to someone else and i feel like the generation coming through below us now is even worse and they suffer deep down you know lots of them will suffer with that inability to love themselves and be secure in their own body because everyone wants instant gratification now i want you know i don't like my nose i'm just going to go and get a nose job i don't like this i'll get a filter on it don't like that i'm just going to go and fix it straight away like the work for things i don't think as hard as maybe you've had to work it yourself and especially some of these challenges yeah, and that, that's something that scares me for, especially for my son's generation. Um, yeah. And I go around school. I, you know, my my work is motivational speaking, and um, primarily, and um, I go around schools and I try to tell them that being successful is is hard work. Um, and I think 
when I go around uh, schools, they're like, what do you want to be? I want to be like a YouTube influencer. I want to be a social yeah. media influencer, this thing. And and they what they see is like, it's like, you know, what they see, just like you were saying, is is what they see, basically. Yeah. The, the, the photos. And, and I do worry, and I say to them, you know, J.K. Rowling went to something like 12 publishers before her first book was published. You know, you've got to knock on doors. And, you know, I'm not the greatest fan of, of social media. I totally understand it. Um, no, I don't totally understand it, but I get it. Um, but it is quite frustrating because, for example, as, as um, an adventurer, say, you, you go to this big company and you ask, look, can you support me on this world first? Um, I had that this um, experience where... They were like, yeah, amazing. It was world first I was, uh, around the world. And they were like, how many followers do you have? And I'm not a great social mediator, um, if that's the word. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I'm not an influencer, let's say. And, yeah. um, and they said, you know, well, we, I had learned afterwards that the money went for somebody who didn't wasn't going on such a, a world first, wasn't going yeah. on such a venture, a world first. Uh, but had a certain amount of followers. Um, yeah. So you are you know, competing against uh, people like that. So that's quite frustrating for me. But I do worry about the um, instant uh, gratification that people can get from social media. And, and going back to when I started as a children's presenter, I think what I enjoyed about that, and um, I was saying how that, the, the fact journalism broadcasting helped to develop my career as an athlete worked was they'd heard that I'd been around the world and I was I was a skydiver I was a scuba diver yeah uh, I, I was doing all of these type of things you know I lived a, a while in New Zealand where that's just the norm basically yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and they what the children saw was they saw me they, they said, look, we've heard that you've run a marathon. Would you mind if we filmed you doing a marathon? And I was like, yeah, of course. So they filmed me doing my marathon. And, you know, they saw the ups and downs, the tears, the, the, the excitement. They saw all emotion that came with that journey to finish that race. Um, and after that, then, it was like, oh, do you mind doing an Ironman? And we'll film you doing that. Yeah, no problem. And it was that's how everything developed. And Had you done an Ironman at that point? Uh, be, uh, I had done an Ironman uh, when I was in my 20s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, um, and then they said, do you mind going down to see Titanic? Yeah, I'll do that. And that, you know, that, that wasn't a, such a physical challenge as such. Uh, but I think it's, it is important for children to see, but you, you can't just kind of go out to the jungle, take pretty photos of the, you running in the jungle and mm -hmm. expect it to be easy. It, it's not. Um, so um, I think it's really important, and I kind of try to be quite honest on social media and say, you know, there are there are tough times, but like I said earlier, the tough times make you stronger. I think yeah. really, and failure is really important because I think failure makes you appreciate the sweet taste of success. You yeah. know, look all the greatest entrepreneurs, sportsmen in the world, they've all failed somewhere on their yeah, road. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I think it's the courage to continue that that counts you know i've not finished uh, races and been absolutely devastated but i've always woken up the fall, following morning say right what why did i not finish that race what went wrong uh, let's analyze it and then i'll wake up and think you know what i'll try again yeah um, it is the courage to just keep going plodding on you know i wasn't you know in school i was <laughs> I wasn't the brightest or the, the fast. I definitely wasn't the fastest nor the strongest runner there. But um, I, I remember being, I failed some of the exams in school and my parents told me, you know, remember about the tortoise? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, yeah. And they were like, if you're determined enough, if you're willing to persevere, if, you know, they, they say in um, marathon running, when you get to the wall, so you can't run through a wall, but you can run around a wall. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's always important. I've, I've kind of stuck with that. And, and I always go with the attitude of train hard, race easy. Um, yeah. I've started, I've started um, uh, the, you were asking about this year um, with motivational speaking and co conference um, 
talks and things being um, cancelled, um, I think I've had to diversify, you know, and, and yeah. being a freelance broadcaster in sport last year was definitely quite a, a, a challenge. And so I, I took the opportunity to go back and um, start something I've been meaning to do for years. So I've started a coaching business, I think. Yeah. You've just got to always have these kind of different avenues coming off one idea. Um, so it, it's about making the best out of a bad situation, really. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I'm fascinated by loads of different things. I've been jotting stuff down as you're, as you're talking. Do you allow yourself, like, once you've completed either, you know, marathon or Ironman, ultra run it, do you allow yourself, like, a week off or days off, or, and you just go, do you know what, I'm going to eat this, 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 and this today. I'm not training for a week. Or are you one of those people that are always in some sort of decent shape to compete, whether it's a couple of 10Ks a week just to keep your foot in? Yeah, I, I'm one of those um, runners. Um, let's go back to the first ultra marathon I had done. Yeah. Um, Amazon. Uh, basically, S4C wanted me to produce a series that would take extreme sport to another level. And, and, um, and what, was that your first experience of extreme sport outside of I would class and, and Ironman is pretty an extreme, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, the longest, longest run I had done before that was a marathon. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had an extreme sport as in I, I, I'm a skier so I climb uh, okay. mountains and then I ski down yeah. you know, mountains. Um, you know that, that's quite extreme but when it comes to running yeah that was, was, that was extreme running for me and um, so for example with the jungle marathon people were saying to me before the race actually ended some really experienced ultra runners were saying, oh, what's your next race? And I was like, oh, I haven't got a next race. You know? <laughs> I was kind of just hoping to finish this, you know? Yeah. And, and I remember the start of the race, I was kind of um, talking to these three um, men who had won uh, these incredible um, competitions with men, Men's Health, I think, a magazine or something yeah. like that. And they had won a place there, three of them. And they were like, yeah, we're going to, when we cross the finish line, we're going to do this and this and this. And this race was a week-long race. We had to wade through rivers and swamps full of um, anacondas, jungle full of snakes and, and jackals. How do you do that, like? How do you... It's I can't get... Mind. It's all in the mind. Oh. You've got to have... You've got to have... Um, You've got to have a plan A, plan B, plan C, but you've also have to have a plan X, Y, Z as well. I think ultra runners are masters at, at organising. Uh, you know, we have to prepare for a year's long training schedule. We have to, in that race then, we have to prepare for running out of water. Um, you know, I've, I, saw, I was telling my son yesterday, we, we, he's studying winter, you know, and he... You know, I was telling him about how I came face to face to the wolf, you know, and, and in the Arctic. And, you know, you, you have to do your research. Nobody plans to fail. They just fail to plan. So you've got to go into these races knowing, right, if I come across a polar bear, I know there will there'll be my SOS um, button. And then you have to have faith in the support team that will come and pick you up in the helicopter. You know, you've just got to have. Yeah. Faith. It's not it's, it's not that much of an individual sport, really. You've got. You know, you are on, physically on your own, but um, you have got people who you entrust your life in, basically. So, so you're in the Amazon. It's a 150-mile race. Are there set markers every day, and then you sleep overnight, and then you go again the next day? Or is it a case of there are, I don't know, say there's, x number of runners and there are station points to get to on the journey where there is someone to help you if something was wrong and um, all these up to, uh, races are different so okay for the marathon as i was saying with these three guys um they were saying at the start uh, of the race it was a six stage race yeah so the faster you ran your stage the longer you had off that evening to prepare for the following day so you had um, 150 over those seven days. So one stage was a 48-hour 
um, stage. And I, I did that in 24 hours, well, 20 hours actually. So I had the other day off. For some people, um, and this is where you, gosh, you have the utmost respect. I'm a runner, but some people walk it. And some people, I, you know, for example, that 60 mile day, I spent 20 hours through the jungle. They spent 46 hours doing it. I know they were walking, but still they are 46 hours on their feet. So, and they're, so you, they're not sleeping then in that time either. But they don't get the sleep, you see. So with, with something like the Jungle Marathon, the, the faster you are, the longer uh, you have off that evening. Yeah. You look after your feet. You know, you've got deep blisters. I lost all of my toenails. Um, oh, it, and it wasn't just me. Everybody was doing it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I had, and on the uh, penultimate stage, which was the um, 60 mile, um, I was running with a couple of um, uh, North Face athletes and a Salomon athletes and, and, you know, the best in the world, basically. And, and I tripped. Uh, and as everybody did, because you're in, in the jungle, you've got things everywhere, basically. Yeah. And, um, I was all of a sudden, they said, oh, we'll wait for you. And I was like, oh, no, just carry out. You know, I'll see you later on a checkpoint. Uh, there are check that with the jungle, there were 10K checkpoints. OK, so, yeah. But you've got to realise as well, a 10k would sometimes take you hours to get through because you've got to go through these swamps and, you know. Yeah, just you know, dense and yeah. obviously different terrain up and down. and down, yeah. And, yeah. and the elevation is really high. You don't realise uh, the elevation because obviously you've got the canopy of the jungle covering it. Yeah. So, um, so uh, I decided not to take a GPS watch with me. I just took a normal time, cheap Timex because I thought if I can... That, that would just play with my mind because I know I can do um, a 10k sub 40 and I know I can run a marathon. Fast as well. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, well. I wish I was faster, but you know, I can do a marathon in three hours. So, yeah. um, so say when somebody tells you, or oh, you are going to take uh, 10 hours to do um, 25 miles. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, that's, so, so I thought, I'm not going to take a GPS watch with me because that will just be torture on my, basically, mental. Yeah. So, um, but some people did, and, and you could see they were losing it, basically, because they, they, they had the inner um, turmoil of knowing that, like, three miles is, is just a park run for, for, for many. But yeah, yeah. But is, is ridiculous. So um, you did have these 10K um, checkpoints. And... I'd tripped and these runners had gone and I thought I'd catch them, but you know, they, they weren't that far ahead, but I couldn't see them. Um, anyway, by, uh, I'd been running now for 10 hours and I uh, stepped on a hornet's nest yeah. and um, I got bitten um, quite about 40 times, something like that. I was counting them and I was running on my own, screaming and they were all buzzing around me. And then it was about, I, I ran about a hundred meters and then they disappeared so I must have left the territory or something like that and then um, all of a sudden I thought that's my tongue is swelling um I'm, I'm gonna collapse I'm, I'm really weak and then my mind was the you know the other voice in my mind was saying are you really weak is it just you finding excuses to give up yeah, yeah. is my tongue really swelling <laughs> and, um, so you know I had all these kind of conversations going inside um, my mind and then I got to the checkpoint and I saw a paramedic and I was like, oh, my, ten, ten, my tongue is fell out, I can't speak. You know, I, I even was talking as if my tongue I was uh, had swollen. And he looked into my mouth and he went, no, it's not. And, and he, <laughs> he's, he's, um, he's a friend of mine, an ex-Marine, so there's no, there's no bull there at all. Yeah. Like, no, it's not, just carry on. Uh, so I went, oh, gosh, all right. So I carried on. And then I, I thought um, I got to this next checkpoint and this was part of the 60 mile, the penultimate stage of this 150 mile race. And I had, because I was one of the front runners, uh, they allowed me through this part of the jungle um, because if, if you were in the back, uh, they wouldn't allow you through because you would. That would mean that you'd be there overnight. And I was going yeah. into Jaguar territory, right? Okay. So I, I went into ja Jaguar territory, and you knew, you knew the Jaguars because it's. It was as if you were walking into a house where loads of cats lived. <laughs> it just. It was just oh. like basically really, really yeah. strong. And yet, 
I had to have faith again with um, a, a tribesman I had met who had this massive machete knife who I had befriended and I had asked him about these jaguars and he told me I've lived in the jungle for 40 years all my life he said and um, I've only seen jaguar once but I've lost count how many times a jaguar has seen me so he was saying you know they are shy animals and you've got to believe that so when I was going through this jungle um this part of this of the jungle and I was really struggling because you know I, I'd lost my toenails I had um tiny cuts and they weren't big but because uh, I was in the jungle everything was septic you know and I was yeah. I, I was carrying about 10 kilos of weight as well on my on my back and um, I was really struggling and I thought to myself right that's it I, I have to get through this particular part of the jungle about 20 miles and um, once I see the cameras on the other side of, of this part of the jungle I'll I'll give up um, and I know it's all filmed on camera but just people like Jeopardy I'll just think of a really good end link and then hopefully S4C will give me a second series where I can try a bit harder. So, <laughs> I was thinking, right, what, what can I say? What can I say? And I was like, yeah, I'll do an Alma Schwarzenegger style of I'll be back style end link and dramatic. I'm, I'll fall to the floor and I'll be yeah. and say, you know, it's about, you know, giving your best, not giving up or something like that. And then I remembered my mother had given me this tiny piece of, of um, paper and on it, just before I left the Arctic, uh, for the Amazon, and on it, it said, um, glory is not by never falling, but in the way we rise when we do fall. Yeah. And I hadn't, hadn't thought about it. And if you think about it, this tiny piece of paper weighed nothing. But yet I was going to throw it because I thought it would be too heavy to carry because I I was taking everything that I didn't need out of my rucksack to try and keep it as light as possible. Yeah. By now, like I said, it was about 10 kilos, but I started the race with 15 kilos of, yeah. because of the food and everything, and that was getting less and less. Um, so I, I decided not to throw this piece of um, uh, paper that my mother had given to me. And then all of a sudden I thought, yeah, it's not about how many times I fall. It's about how many times I pick myself up. So that's what I did. And going back to what I was saying at the start, it was about putting one foot in front of another. And as I did that, no word of a lie, over maybe 10K, I, this like surge of energy came from deep within the soul. And I really don't know if it was endorphins, religion a lot of ultra runners are very religious it was i it was the painkillers i do I really <laughs> but something um spiritual happened where i remember knocking my feet on the floor and there was no pain in my feet i all the pain i i didn't feel the horrendous pain i'd had throughout the day and this strength came from deep within my my, my soul and I just know that this is when my body gave up and my mind took over. And I was just on a high throughout all the, the rest of that stage. Uh, I just felt this massive surge of energy and, and it, it carried me on for about another 20 miles, you know. So um, I, I think a lot of the strength when it comes to ultra running is not, not just about being physically strong or physically fit. It's about being physically strong mentally as well. Um, you know, I've trained with special forces and, and they've taught me a lot, you know, um, about surviving and about being um, being strong mentally as well. A lot of them are very good friends of mine now. And, and I, we often talk about the mental games that you play when you, yeah. you're out there and you've got, you know, you're at the bottom, lowest ebb um, and, and you find somehow a way of keeping going. You see, I can't relate to, I can relate to tough training sessions, but they last like an hour, do you know what I mean? Like I can't relate to 10 hours into a run and just thinking, oh, I've got another gear here, I can go again. Like I, I fully accept and I, I completely agree that the body will give up before the mind does. You've just got to train yourself to just keep going and it is temporary pain and you will get there if you just don't give up. 
But you've got to remind yourself as well, like I said earlier, the whys, why do you do it? So when I yeah. went up, and, and this often happens in a race, you know, it just comes. I've got, in the book I talk about it, I've got pointers now. I know, oh, this I, it's like clockwork. I know what's gonna, what I'm going to go through. I, I go through a phase where I'm hating all the support team. You need to go away and leave me alone. <laughs> I, I need to be in my, in my you know, dark place. Yeah. Um, but you also have to remind yourself, of your why, you know, I do it. My my motivation is different now. I do it for my son because I think it's really important. And you were saying about social media, I think it's really important that he also has a role model who shows him that it hard work does eventually pay off. Yeah. And I think it's very important for him to realise that ordinary people can do extraordinary things as well. And and I also think I want him to learn about the importance of having a goal a goal that will take him out of his comfort zone, a goal that will make him have to reach for it because by doing things like that, and this is what's happened to me, by really forcing myself out of my comfort zone, I have found talents and abilities I never knew I had. Yeah, and of course. I'm really passionate about passing that on to him. The other reason um, I, I, I do it is because I just don't want to be rubbish at life. I've only been given this one you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to live life to, to its fullest. And um, I, I want to, to, to make sure that I do that, basically. Um, and, you know, it's taught me so much um, ultra running, but not just ultra running, just stepping out of my comfort zone has taught me so much um, in, in life in general, you know, when things have gone wrong in, in maybe other parts of my life I've been able to kind of go do you know what I'm, I'm stronger than this I can cope with this brush it off and, and I you know yeah. go away it's, it's that mindset sort of fascinate me and I'm, I'm fascinated about this like you've never I assume you'd never been to the Amazon at that particular time before doing that so you've never run an ultra marathon and you've never been to the Amazon which by all accounts is one of the roughest terrains to live in and to survive in if you're to believe what SAS who dares win say because I've watched that and that's about as close as I've ever got what do you fear do you fear anything when you're out there where like for me I would probably fear the swamps and the alligators and the animals more so than actually getting through it because I've never been in that environment yeah people just say oh, how did you get over your fear I've never got over my fear um, gosh, you know, I'm absolutely petrified of snakes. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, but I've I've learned to to um, to embrace it. To I know the um, things that um, tick it off. I know how to cope with it. It's it's the same uh, attitude I take with with it. Um, yeah, I've I've just learned to to take fear as another part of emotion. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm fearful, um, but you know, this is gonna make me more aware. It's gonna put me, you know, make me, uh, I'm not complacent. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna take for granted in this race. And I have seen so many really strong athletes go out there and go, you know, I'm fit, you know, I've got, I had this when I was, you know, um, running my 10k i got this pp doing this and this and, and going back to these three guys you know they were like yeah i've done this done that done this like on the on the fifth day i was picking them up you know and helping them because you know they were in tears i think you can't be complacent you've got to um if if you're if you've got fear that use it to your to your strength it means that you're um, aware uh, you're conscious of everything. You're always looking around uh, in the Arctic. You know, I was only sleeping 20 minutes every 24 hours. I was going 46 hours nonstop. You know, I was full of fear, um, but it kept me going. Um, it, I used it as motivation, if that makes sense. Um, it meant that that this what I was doing was important to me. Um, yeah, that that first. So the first ultra marathon with the jungle. What did you feel when you finished it? What was, did you break down? Was there tears or what was that that emotion and that elation that sort of came through you when you, when you crossed that line? 
I just realised that I've not answered one of your questions about uh, what did I do after I finished the race because a lot of people were saying, "Have you got another ultra marathon ready?" Um, yeah. I'm struggling with it. I need time out. Um, yeah. so, you know, I do go back home. I I start living. Uh, I still run, but I don't yeah. run to that um, extreme level. Um, you know, I just run. I pull my GPS watch off and I just run because I enjoy it. Um, but the, the feeling I felt was this emptiness. Um, okay. I, I described it as, oh, it was total elation, you know, initially when he crossed that finish line. Yeah. That um, feeling of um, pride and that you've managed, you've worked so hard for this goal and then you've achieved it. That gives you such a great sense of... Um, pride basically and and you, you think you know i did that um and it gives you self-belief as well that uh, and and you can you know that often during the race you doubt yourself can i really do this yeah. you cross the finish line and you can go yeah i can do it and you know i i'm sure i walked away from the jungle marathon a few inches taller um yeah. But, but the feeling afterwards was emptiness. And the way I describe it in the book is, is a bit like the wedding blues. You know, you've been preparing for a wedding and, it, you know, it all comes and then after a day it's gone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. what's next? Yeah, and, and you are tempted to kind of um, keep going um, to the next race. But I always try to pull the brakes off, um, put the brakes on rather. Yeah, um, yeah. Before, um, before um, going and start planning your next challenge. I do need the challenges. I do like them. That's me at the end of the day. Um, and I'm very lucky that I get sponsored to do it. These kind of um, amazing, crazy yeah. challenges. Position, I love it, but I really do. And it's very hard sometimes because you go going back to social media, you look at social media and you're seeing other adventures you know always say oh i'm doing this and doing that doing this doing that and you think oh should should i be you know jumping on the on that wagon and kind of should i be planning now but it's you know it's really hard to kind of go no lori you need time with your family yeah your body needs a break as well you know I'm, i was running 150 miles a week by the time i, I went to the arctic um you know that i trained with the uh, special forces and they they taught me as well that you didn't have to be the fastest or the strongest, um, but you had to be the most and the best prepared athlete on that start yeah. line. So, you know, I trained with them. They taught me, for example, when I was out um, in Norway with them to um, repair my punctures on my pulk, uh, blindfolded. You know, I had three pairs of mitts and they were puncturing these, these tires and uh, blindfolding and, you know, blindfolding me. And then I had to kind of repair it. Because when you're tired, you've slept 12 hours that week, you're, you're in minus 72 degrees Celsius with wind um, in, in the wind, because the wind was about 70 miles per hour. Um, you know, doing simple things like doing your shoelaces is an absolute nightmare. Um, so with the Arctic, you know, it, was, it wasn't just about who was the strongest, it was about who was most prepared. And I think they've told me since then, the organisers, that, you know, I was one of the best prepared athletes they've ever seen in, in that race. Um, yeah. So meticulous. My, my husband would time me uh, packing my um, sleeping bag. So, you know, I knew um, when I was really tired, I knew 40 seconds, I can be out. I've dug my snow hole, um, which is like a mini um, igloo. I can be in there within two minutes and, you know, I'll, I'll sleep for 20 minutes and then I'll pack. And you, you don't want to waste any time when you're in the Arctic because, you know, if you stop and you're faffing for a minute, two minutes, you, you know, you you know, I had a bit of frostbite. The lady uh, the year before had lost part of her nose um, because of frostbite. You know, so you, you didn't have time to make any mistakes out there. You had yeah. to be really spot on with everything. How do you deal with two parts to this so am i right in saying that with the arctic i'm not sure about the jungle but with the arctic you were actually producing that tv series as well which has then gone on to win 
awards, uh, BAFTAs and uh, other awards. How yeah. do you how do you manage your time between trying not to hallucinate, get injured, get through that race, survive versus oh this is going to make really good TV. This is so everyone else is going to enjoy watching it, even though I'm absolutely fucking hating it right now. Um, you know what? I kind of um, had to step back a bit during the race uh, same i was producing the jungle marathon as well and and okay the same there and that that went on to win a lot of awards as well um and um you you have to step back sometimes but having worked in the industry you also know what people want to want to hear um and i know um some adventurers good friends of mine they don't like showing the the, the tough times on camera yeah. But I, me personally, um, I would want to see that because it would make, you know, it would be, you realise how tough it is for that person. Yeah. Um, so there was one, there was one point in the Arctic where the uh, director um, said to me, how are you feeling? And I was like, how do you think I'm feeling? You know, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, how do you think I'm feeling? You know, I'm like everybody else has dropped out of this race. I'm the only one left, and I've still got like 150 miles to go. Um, and I, you know, I'm only halfway through this damn race. Yeah. And he said, well, um, you know, just say how, you know, what I've been seeing. I said, I haven't seen anything. You know, I was losing my patience because I. Yeah. And I, for the last, basically, I was on he had stopped me basically on a hundred mile stretch so you could see the next village which was a hundred miles away um so you could see the light because if you think about it out there you haven't got light pollution or anything so even the tiniest light you see it very clearly so i could see this village for a hundred miles basically and and it didn't come any closer so i was like <laughs> I was like, you know, oh. and I was really tired. And he said, what about, what about that massive ship you've just passed, which is stuck in the ice road? Because I was on, on the ice by now. I was, on, I was on the Arctic Ocean. Yeah. And I hadn't seen it. I had literally just passed a massive ship and I had not seen it. And I said, what ship? I haven't seen a ship. And I started to cry. And I knew, and I knew then, this is the bit that they're going to clip and use in the document and I was trying and you can see me knocking my stick against the ice for straight <laughs> trying to stop myself from crying and I was going I know what you're doing I know what you're doing you try to push me to cry you try to push me to... and then all you know and then I started to cry the tears would freeze and then I realized there's no point crying you know so <laughs> there, there, there were things like that you know um but you know at the end of the day you've just got to be yourself that support that support staff that are with you how are they traveling because if you so, so if we haven't explained so the arctic was when was that 2011 you won that everyone else dropped out but you're the only one to complete it so that's unbelievable because it was 350 miles like 350 miles is pro where are we are now in cardiff 350 miles must be manchester it's basically running up to North Wales and back. And back, is it? Yeah. Cardiff to Wrexham and back. Like, that's... <laughs> I can't get my head around this, right? What are the, how, how are the sports staff travelling? Because you're obviously not on your own. It's too dangerous for you to do it on your own. Oh, no, there was, there was... Yeah, you were on your own. But the okay. Way the way it works and you know i spoke to the crew who filmed the james cracknell and ben fogel uh, and, yeah. and they went to the arctic you basically film a lot uh, of gvs we call it general reviews uh for the first 24 hours um 46 hours something like that um you know um because also they didn't know how long i was going to last in the race so it's about just getting loads of footage in and then I also did not want them to be constantly behind me because that would be unfair on the other competitors but also unfair on, on, on me because I yeah. didn't want to finish a race thinking oh actually I had extra help by having a support team constantly. Yeah, 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 okay. 
because when I did the Jungle Marathon, um, 150 started the race, only 50 finished, and I finished overall in 10th position. Yeah. Um, and it went out, and I had I had great feedback, uh, but I had a lovely a lovely letter saying I really enjoyed the program. It was fantastic, uh, but I know how television works. I'm presuming you didn't run it all. And and I was like, yeah, I did run it all, you know. Oh, shit bags. Yeah, I did, and I didn't have extra help or anything like that. Uh, the camera crew would, um, dry, they, obviously, they couldn't get into the deepest part, just the deepest part of the jungle. Yeah. Um, because of, of the terrain, uh, but they would meet us at the checkpoints. So they would they would film me. So you know, I did it all. So when it came to the Arctic, I didn't want anybody thinking that and and i'm not that type of person so when the camera crew stopped kind of filming a lot of me during those first 24 hours uh, they kind of left me be um but but um they the they joined the team the organizer said if they were joining uh, they had to also not just be a camera crew they had to be a support crew for all the other athletes as well yeah yeah so yeah. when i was tired for example they said look you know you can jump in and have um a hot drink in the back of the vehicle if you want other other athletes have done it and i was like no no way you know i wasn't even taking um, yeah yeah uh, official help basically yeah uh, because i just did not want to for anything to to anybody to tell me oh you know she she had advantage or i didn't want me to think that i had um yeah yeah you're a glutton for punishment what like when you're when you're going so i don't know 100 mile stretch in one day like this this is probably a stupid question but i when i walk around roth lake or heath or wherever like I've got earphones in. I'm listening to a podcast. I'm listening to music. I'm, I'm keeping my mind entertained. I suppose. What are you doing when you're walking that far? Uh, how long did the 350 miles take you? Uh, seven days. So in that seven days, what are you doing so that you just don't go crazy? Uh, yeah, good question. You're not allowed to take um, headphones with you, so you can't listen to music because once a day there'd be this massive ice truck. That would pass. Um, so you had, and also the animals. You had to be aware of of animal sounds. Um, so uh, you, you weren't allowed to take um, music. I did kind of try to put um, when it was just me, and I thought it was quite safe. I I had um, I always had my phone with me because of um, uh, health and safety, and and I put my headphones in just to try and listen to a podcast or something. But that's yeah. all I hear was this la, 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 la. My yeah. mother, spoken word just didn't sound like spoken word at all. So I, that lasted about five minutes. So um, it was just me, myself and I, really, just kind of going through your life. You know, you went to really dark places where you remember things you did when you were a child, you know, maybe did something wrong or upset somebody and you'd be there, you know, crying because it was so real. Um, yeah. and, and also, um, I think there was, uh, this is where the television side of things did play an advantage. Um, I, I kept thinking, right, if, when I see the camera crew next, what should I say to the camera? So that kept my mind going. I kept thinking about lengths. So it was like I was having like a diary in my head. Um, you know, when I when I do this, I'll, when I see them, I'll talk about the the walking sticks. Or when I when I see them, I'll talk about how frustrating this feeling is. The only thing is, um, I think I don't know if it's true for other athletes, but short term memory is is happens. Out yeah. There so tired so i remember i used to they would pass me and they go all right and i was like all right and i shout to them and i say remember i want to talk about um uh, how the maths that i'm doing in my head okay yeah, so they'll pass and then they find me a few miles down the road and they said you're ready for your link 
what what link you know what 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 would I call that? <laughs> um, so one of one of the things that I I'm not I'm not great at maths as my five year old would tell me, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you know I would do things like right I'm going um, ten miles per hour at the moment or you know it definitely wasn't that but say ten um, kilometers a, 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 an hour at the moment what would that be in miles per hour? And if I do that over 12 hours, how much? And if I, you know, I was just doing these, all these yeah, maths. Yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes I would forget, so I'd go back to the start and do it again. So I was constantly trying to keep my mind occupied. Sometimes your mind had nothing in it and you would find this fantastic white space in your head where you could go for hours and it would just you'd just be on another planet basically and you would love every second and then you'd be thinking where did the last 10 hours go yeah uh, sometimes you would especially in the dark for example um you were talking about how did, did i keep my mind um going basically because that's that's what it was in the end my mind yeah, yeah. i fractured my feet basically when i pulled my trainers off at the end after seven days my feet were black with bruises um they were all fractured i had to pull a toe toenail off um oh, Jesus Christ. because i knew i i knew i could not go any further with this horrendous blister under my toenail so i thought well i can either quit with only you know after 300 miles i can either quit now uh or i'll and, and i'll never forgive myself or i'll yeah. turn it off now and i'll just yeah i'll just take some anti um anti Pain, painkillers or whatever pain killers or yeah. Uh, yeah, whatever and uh i'll just get on with it and that's that's what and i tell you what when i did pull that toenail off the relief oh, was jesus christ you know, see, you do things. I wouldn't recommend anybody do it in this country. But it was all about, you know, it was all about survival, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, getting the thing, getting the job done, basically, and reminding yourself, right? What I think it's about discipline, isn't it? It's about reminding yourself what do you want now, and what do you want the most. So yeah. at that moment, with the toenail, for example, I said, well, what I want now is I want to kind of just quit but what i want most is to finish that race and and when you remind yourself about that it's enough to keep you going um but um i've completely forgotten your question no 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 <laughs> it, it's i i i love listening to, to where you're going on this journey uh, what what is your what's your family like with you if you are like is it hard for them to put up with what I can imagine you it can be difficult at times maybe being around you if you've got a big training week and you're doing 150 miles and you're about to jet off to a country which we're not familiar with to do something which the normal person doesn't do like you you, you said about doing overnight 60 mile runs on the bracket beacons that's dangerous enough on its own like people die doing SAS training in the bracket beacons like, yeah, but how, that, see, because I've pushed myself so much, I have learnt now that I can, and this is what the uh -huh. SES friends taught me, um, I can sleep on one minute during that 60 mile hike. Um, I was with my friend and, and I said, look, I'm, I'm really struggling, I'm seeing unicorns. And um, I said, I need, I need to sleep. And he said, um, yeah, no problem. Um, you know, I'll, we ha I'm, like the conditions are changed it was really really windy and and um and i was we were on the edge of, of a mountain and i was like you know i'm just i'm just a danger to us both basically because i'm kind of i was doing like a dressage style. yeah yeah so i said i need to sleep and he said right no worries so we found a big rock and we uh, kind of huddled behind this rock and um i he said uh, oh just um we'll um I i'll just sort my bag out and i said no i Give me one minute, one minute sleep, and I'll be okay. And I had one minute, and I was I was okay. So it is about you know you learn from from experience <laughs> what, what your body can do. Um, that is mental. Yeah, and and you know it, it is about. I I just yeah I, I just think you have to make your training tough as well. So when you do when you are stuck in the Arctic and 
you know, you're absolutely freezing. Um, you're tired, you're hungry, you're really struggling mentally, that you kind of say, do you know what, Lowry? I've been in this position when I was in Norway with the soldiers and I got through it and I can get through it now. So it's, it's about putting yourself in as close a um, scenario as possible to that. Yeah. And, and being prepared for it. Um, but it, but it, my, my family, um, back to your question, they're medics as well, my parents. Um, so I, they see it from that side. They, they are always so worried about my body, about what am I doing to my knees. And, but they also know it's my passion. They yeah. also know that I, I need it. So they're always like, oh, go and do this race. But, you know, when you've done it, just, just finish, you know, just finish and don't do it. <laughs> go back to your singing. Go back to your music. <laughs> And then I go, yeah, 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 I'll do that. And then I finish and I'm like, yeah, I think I'll do another challenge. They're like, oh, what are you doing, Laurie? We worried about you. But they've never stopped me from doing it. Yeah, yeah. My husband's a really big um, support as well. Uh, you know, poor Dab, he hears the alarm go, go off about half past four, five o'clock in the morning and I'm out of the door and coming back in time for him to go to work and then you know we play tag basically and and i take over um the the childcare duties then um so it is about teamwork he enjoys running as well so um what we used to do before having um my son is i used to go out um running all day and then i'd say what time are you back from work and he'd say you know six o'clock whatever and i'd be like right okay when i'm back be ready to go out running so he'd be ready to go out for another 10 mile, 10 miler with me. So I, I'd be able to add that extra 10 miles on tired with fresh legs. So he'll have his fresh legs. At his I'd, pace. And I'd be trying to struggle to keep up with his pace then. So he, he was a great support um, uh, team for me as well. So, but do you know what? They, they're very patient. I have to, have to be honest. Um, so you, must, you must go through some calories and some food each week with this amount of training. Do you know what? I'm not. I'm not ma a massive um, nutritionist. Um, you know, I'm not strict with my food. I just, I just eat what I I I I, I know my body now. Yeah. You know, when I after after a session, I, I I know what my body craves. It's it's very simple. Just um, cereal and milk. So I get my carbs and my protein in. Um, I'm, I'm I do get sponsored by. Uh, companies with with food but um i i tend to stick to to real food um, yeah. and, and it is it is a tough one because how you know i did the dragon's back race last year which was 300 miles and twice the height of everest how how do you know what your body will need after three days of running and, and you know normally i took like five days worth of brioches chocolate brioches which i love yeah. by the second day i was fed up of brioches <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, I can't look at them now. So you know, you just gotta just know your body so well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who's strict. Um, I think if I'm strict in so many things in my life with training and other things, I can't be strict in everything. Do you drink? Do you like? Will you allow us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not the greatest drinker, but you know, yeah, I do. I don't go without alcohol. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I'm I'm a heavy drinker, but you no. know, I do like um, wine and, and yeah, yeah, wine and things like that. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I do do allow myself that. I think sometimes, but, but some, but you know, naturally, when my training increases and I need to get up at those half past four uh, for those thirty milers before breakfast. I, you know, I don't want to drink. I don't no, no, I know. A heavy um, plate of pasta before um, yeah. the following morning because I know I can't, I can't perform with with such starch in my stomach. It's about, and yet for somebody else, you know, a massive plate of lasagna the night before a massive race is, is the perfect meal. So yeah, I'm everyone's gonna, different, aren't they? Um, I, I appreciate that you've been taking a bit of time. It must be coming up to tea time in the Morgan household. Yeah. A couple of things. Um, firstly, the book. So, why why the book? Where can people find it? Uh, what has 
all of these experiences given you that you were able to put in a book that I'm, I'm not just saying this, 100% going to buy this straight after we finish this. I've, I could talk to you for hours. I'm fascinated by it. I've, I've, I've told you everything. You don't need to buy the book now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it, it is basically, um, I've, I've talked about this, but in, in deeper um, uh, form, basically. And I yeah. talked about um, how I coped with my injury. Um, I I talk about um, how I ended up going on on this journey, and I talk about more about um, the, the the last race I did, which I haven't spoken about, uh, the Dragon Back race. Yeah, yeah. I went to that race with um, the consultant telling me, my knee consultant telling me, you have to quit running after after running this race. That you have to kind of quit your profession basically and and the the story starts there basically and it finishes with me in the dragon's back race and um and it, it's about how i cope with the, the mental side of, of that um it's it's on its fourth edition already and it has been out nice. year yet um so it's it's been doing uh rather well i i thought only my parents would buy it and they actually <laughs> read the book before it went to print so um i am really overwhelmed by by the response so it's been doing quite well um on the amazon reviews but you could buy it there but you know i would urge anybody to support local um especially yeah. these days if you want to sign copy get in touch with me on instagram and yeah. um and and it's it's basically my story um and I kind of explained why I do it. And I explain about how the motivational tips that I use to get myself through these races. Yeah. Uh, there's so many, so many other stories that I've, I've not spoken about. There's tons, right, that I've written down, which, you know, like I said, the Ironmen, the marathons, the Angle, Isle of Anglesey Ring of Fire, the yacht race, you know, with you and yeah, you. Amazing. Yeah, and like, I'd... Yeah. I'd I'd love to get you back on at some point later in the year and yeah, chat about loads of these other things because that yacht race looks unbelievable. The, the three, was it three 50 mile ultras in three days from Stononia to Brecon? Like some of these challenges. I did that purely because I just had Willem and I just thought I didn't have it in me. I thought maybe I'd lost that competitive edge. The edge, yeah. And I did it. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. Honest to goodness. Class. I love, I love your mindset. I love your outlook. Thank you. I think more people could use that in everyday life and business and sport, no matter what level you play at. So yeah, hopefully... That's, that's what it's, uh, the book, uh, from what I've been reading uh, with the reviews, is um, I think it's, um, it's not just about an athlete's life. It's, it kind of covers a lot of areas. Yeah. I can imagine. Look, thank you so much. Where can people find you on social media? Sorry, again. Um, so I'm on Instagram. And yeah. It's at underscore Lowry Morgan. Yeah. It's the same for Twitter. Yeah. Um, and I'm Lowry Morgan on Facebook. But Instagram's the best way, or Twitter, basically, to, to get in touch with me. Love that. Hey, look, thank you so much. The book is called... Be Beyond Limits, Beyond Limits, I'm definitely going to get a copy, um, thank you so much for it, honestly it's fascinating, I can't wait to catch up again, and I, 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 I you find one. honestly I'd be so grateful, like I've got a bookshelf just by there, and it's got, I don't know, 50, 60 books on there, and I've, I've made a point, I've probably read about 40 at the moment, I, I, and I, I don't want to buy another one now until I've read them all. I will 100% put yours at the top of the pile the minute it comes because I want to learn more about what you've done. Some of what you've spoken about, I will be taking more into my life because there are definite areas for growth that I think a lot of people could, could take from what you've done. So I found a lot of people have been buying it for their children as well, so I'll need your daughter's uh, name and then I'll uh, sign it for her as well. Oh, that's honestly, she will be absolutely buzzing about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to Tiny Rebel Brewery. They give us a couple of beers every episode. So huge thanks to them. Thanks to everyone that 
downloads, subscribes, rates, reviews, positive, negative, we'll take it all. One final question. Anything lined up for the future where we can, in a non-COVID world ideally, anything lined up where, where we can see you? Uh, yeah, basically, as I was saying, I'm uh, diversifying. So in the my knees are beginning to go, um, as I, you'll find out in my book. Yeah. So, venturing into the world of cycling so i've got a few massive world firsts coming up whenever we're allowed to do it yeah and, uh yeah just keeping on working in in the world of rugby and just um my run fluence i've started a coaching company now yeah i saw that yeah yeah so that's gone really well um overwhelmed with the response there so yeah just just enjoying life being with my family and just enjoying the little tiny things in life basically I love it. I love you. We are going to catch up again at some point. I can't wait to read your book. Underscore Larry Morgan, thank you so much for coming on. Look after yourself, right? And you too, Mikey. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Thank you, guys. Catch you later.